And this morning, we are in the book of John. In fact, we will look at two passages together. So the book of John, chapter number 20. John, chapter number 20. And then we will also look at a couple verses in the book of Colossians. So John, chapter 20. And then also Colossians, chapter 3. John, chapter 20, we will read verses 1 through 9. And responsively, as our custom is, I will read the odd verses, and let's read the even verses together for this first passage. John chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. I'll read the odd verses. The Bible says in verse number 1, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and the other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. And let's go to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter number 3, we will read verses 1 through 4. I will read the odd verses. We will read the even verses together. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, verse number 1, in verse 1 it says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead. Your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this day. I thank you for our church. Thank you for our guests, the music, all the preparation that went into this day. But Lord, most of all, on this Easter Resurrection Sunday, we thank you for Christ. Not just the fact that he died for us, but the fact that he rose in victory over death and sin. And because of it, we have victory in him. Please bless our service and all that goes on. Be with pastor as he preaches, all of us as we listen. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Oh. 
just bore the pain I fashioned with my sin. He laid down his life without a word. And now I begin to see how I can be like him. Cause he didn't turn. my stripes that I might go free to love one another he's commanded us to do he said love your brother as I have loved you so I will not turn stripes that I might go free. Oh Lord, use my life that others may go free. Thank you for that, ladies. This morning we're going to look primarily in the verses we read in Colossian. Of course, um, we all understand that the resurrection is, is a huge, huge thing in Christianity. It's, it's, a, it's a very important doctrinal belief that we have. Um, without the resurrection, really, there's no difference between Christianity and, every, and any other type of belief. Uh, many of them were started or founded by someone who said a bunch of things and then they died, and they remained dead. Uh, but Jesus Christ, who was God in the flesh, said those things and said that he would die and rise from the dead, and he did absolutely so. The proof of that is everywhere. If you look at the prophecy in the Old Testament, we've looked at it in times past, where uh, just eight of the prophecies fulfilled, eight or nine of the prophecies fulfilled about Jesus Christ, the odds of that happening on accident would be the same as filling the state of Texas with um, silver dollars two feet high and going in there and finding one particularly marked silver dollar. It's astronomical. It just could not have happened on accident. And so the, the resurrection is a very, very, very important doctrine. But when we think primarily about the resurrection, we think about how it affected Christianity and, and Jesus Christ, and, and we look at the story, and, and, and really, we're not going to look at John chapter, uh, John chapter 20. I just wanted to read it because it was Easter Sunday, and that's the resurrection, and we understand that. But there's a second step to the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection text is a story that we read, is the story of Christ's death and resurrection, and it proves its reality and history. The Colossians text is different in that it's the application of Christ's death and resurrection. And so that's not the reality of history. That's the reality of my life. What difference does it make? We know the book of Colossians was written by Paul. Paul wrote many of the New Testament epistles. And typically the outline of Paul's epistles could be typically the first half of the book he talks about doctrinal issues. And they had some of those issues there, and they did not have a quite, have a correct understanding of Jesus Christ. Someone tried to come in and throw some false beliefs there. But a lot of times you'll look at Paul's book, the second half, 
he talks about practical application. Because of this doctrinal issue or this doctrinal truth, what difference does it have in my life? What difference should it make in my life? And as he dealt with Jesus Christ, that people understood correctly who he was, God in the flesh, he now is applying it. How does that work in my life? And specifically, if you look at it, you can look at the resurrection. Paul is asking a simple question here in Colossians. If ye then be risen with Christ. Really, if you want to formulate that into a question, here's the question. Christ is risen. How about you? See, Jesus Christ arose from the grave. Jesus Christ arose from the dead. In a very spiritual sense, when we receive him as Savior, we should rise from the dead also. You see, the resurrection doesn't just have theological implications, which are our beliefs about God. It has practical applications. And so this morning, very briefly, I, I do see the time, and I know we're a little bit later than normal. I want to give us five evidences that would show whether or not we are risen with Christ like God would want us to be. A person who has risen with Christ after they have trusted him as Savior, here's some evidences. First of all, we will have new goals. We'll have new goals. Look at verse 1. He said, if I then be risen with Christ, here's the first, seek those things which are above, where Christ, arise, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. So, if we are risen with Christ, we will seek those things which are above. The word seek means to go after, to strive after. To strive or go after what? Those things which are above. The things that are spiritual. The things that are eternal. Like Matthew chapter 6, six and verse 33. Uh, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You see, all of us... In some way or another, most people will have goals in their life, and not all goals are bad. Someone said, if you don't have goals, it's like, you know, he who shoots for nothing hits it every time. And some of us do have goals, and they're not bad. Some people have goals. I want to have a great marriage. I want to have a great family. I want to have a fulfilling career. Uh, here's one. I want to be financially stable. Now, there are some goals people have that are just flat out wrong. There are goals that are not tied to God, that do not take God into consideration at all. And in fact, of the matter, sometimes the goals are in direct contrast or opposition to God. But not all of them. But when we are risen with Christ, all of our goals will change. Not that we, you know, I want to have a great family, I want to have a, 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 a great marriage, I want, to, I want to be fulfilled at work. Th those won't necessarily change, but they will change in the fact that now they are not attached to us and our own selfish uh, beliefs and desires. They are attached to the fact that we are Christians that are seeking to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we may want to have great marriages, but we want to have God's purposes in those marriages to honor Him in all that we do. Yes, we will want to have great families, but for God's purposes, so that our children will find and fulfill God's will. Yes, we still may want to have success in our careers, but for God's purposes, that we may provide for our families, be an example of how Christians are to live, and to be able to be a blessing to other people. See, we have these goals, but when we are attached to Christ, when we are risen to Christ, those goals have a whole other meaning, and now we have the right kind of goals. You can look, you can have your own goals without Christ, and you may, uh, you may achieve them in some way, but you will walk away empty and unfulfilled. I remember uh, when I, I was in college in the, in the 80s, and, and I liked football. If you ask me um, what was probably one of the best single-year football teams of all time, it would probably be the 1985 Chicago Bears. I think history would prove that. And Walter Payton was a very, uh, very well-known, very liked football player. But his teams were bad for his whole career. Finally, towards the end of his career, the Chicago Bears were good. And that thing he strived for his whole life to win the Super Bowl. 
And if you know anything about the Bears, they destroyed everybody in the playoffs, and they blew him out in the Super Bowl. But after the Super Bowl, he reached the pinnacle of his career. He had all the personal accolades, and now he won the chip, and they're sitting there like, how does it feel to you? Walter Payton basically said, it's not what I thought it would be. He was unfulfilled by it. He made that statement many other times. What? Look, we may reach our goals, but if our goals don't have a trace of God in them, there's no eternal value in them. But when we're risen with Christ and we seek those things which are above, our goals have a little more bite to them. Our goals have a little bit more uh, uh, substance to them because they're attached also to something that is spiritual. You only get that when you are risen with Jesus Christ. We also will have new desires. Look at verse 2. He says, set your affections on things above. The word affection means to be of the same mind and agree together and to be harmonious in our feelings. And so what has he said? Not only do we have new goals, but our affections are in harmony with the things that are of eternity. In other words, our desires will be the same desires that God would have for us. Too often, Christians' desires are just completely different from the desires that God would have for them. We like things sometimes that God would not like us to like. Now, we're all guilty of that. We see, we live in a flesh that is sinful. And that sinful flesh, we desire the wrong things. The things that are not necessary, that we think are good for us, but are not for us. See, in a sense, we're like children. Ask a child what they want for dinner. No child in their right mind is going to say, I want asparagus. We have vending machines out here. The kids buy stuff. We don't put asparagus in the vending machines. The kids don't like asparagus. But asparagus is good for you. Okay? I, I don't know why. My wife just tells me it is. Okay? You know, what do you want for dinner? I want ice cream. Well, who doesn't want ice cream? But it's not necessarily best for you. We desire the things that aren't necessarily best for us. But when our desires line up with God's desires, we will overcome our bad desires, and we will want those desires that God has for us. There are things, as I became a Christian and started living as a Christian, Brother Bacharo, that I would never have desired before, but those desires changed. I loved our music this morning. I thought it was great. You know, when I went to church, I didn't like that music. In fact, I said, you know what? I'm totally in on church. I'm good with it. That music, that's not what I was used to listening to. I'm out on that. I'll just wait for the message, okay? But as I sat in church and I would hear it, God changed my desires. And I would listen to the words and I'm like, that speaks to me. That's good stuff. I didn't like going to church. First time I ever went to church, I was fifth grade. One time. Second time I went to church, I was in high school. We didn't do church. And so, uh, and, and I just didn't do it. But you know what? God gave me a desire, and I love going to church. I never read my Bible. It wasn't until I was about uh, 17 that I decided, I, I want to read my Bible. And I'm like, I, I wasn't into the Bible. In fact, to be honest with you, when you're not a Christian, it's kind of scary. Yeah, we had one in our house, but it was over there on the shelf. Keep it over there, out of the way. But you know what? God gave me desire, and I started reading my, all those different things. God will give us the desires. We want our desires to line up with heaven. You know how that happens? When we're risen with Christ. Thirdly, <coughs> we have a new life. Look at verse 3. <coughs> For ye are dead... And that's an interesting. And ye in your life is hid with Christ in God. Now, now think about that. He says you're dead, and then three, and your life. Now wait a minute. If we're dead, we don't have a life. That's contradictory. Or maybe we just don't understand it. The point he's making is you are dead and your life is hid. Hid means to be concealed, to escape notice. It's hid with Christ in God. In other words, you're dead. Yes, you're dead to your old life. That's how you were before you knew Jesus Christ. But now that you're a Christian, 
You have the risen life with Christ, and yes, you're dead, but you still have a life, but it is a new life. It's a new life, and it's concealed, or it's, it's completely behind God. A new life. You want to know how your Christianity is going? Let me, ask, let me very plainly explain it to you. What difference has it made in the way that you are living? That we have a new life when we trust Christ is a biblical principle. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That describes some of us pretty well, huh? We're a creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are his workmanship. That means a new product created in Christ Jesus. Do you know when we trusted Christ, we became a brand new person? And the fact of the matter is, we ought to have a brand new life. A brand new life. I just remember how my life radically changed when I started living the risen life. The things that I was doing, the people I was with, the 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 things that were causing issues and pain in my life, that all changed because I now was living for Jesus Christ. And you too can have a new life. You, all of us can look at our life and there's things in our life we don't like. Some of us maybe have more things in our life we don't like. Maybe we think like, you know, this thing just isn't working out. And I know there's got to be more to life. And I know there's got to be a wet, better way. I know that better way. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. And if we'll live for him, everything can be new. And in new, I mean better. Everything could be better. Fourthly, there's a new purpose. He goes, <coughs> when Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then ye also shall appear with him in glory. But he says, when Christ, who is our life, I like the verse in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know what Paul was saying? My whole life wrote, revolves around one thing, Jesus Christ. That's it. That is my life. Oh, I do things that other people do, and I, you know, I don't, you know, we could say as far as, so we have families, and we have this, and we have work, and we have all that stuff, and I get all of that, that's part of our life, but that is not our life. If you're a Christian, our life ought to be Jesus Christ. Amen. Someone said he's the top priority of his life. I like someone that says he's like, the, he's like the middle of the wheel. You know you have a wheel that spins and all the spokes go to that little middle. He's, he's everything. Everything in our life shoots out from that. Listen, a Christian is not something we are on Sundays only. A Christian is not something, you know, like I'm a, I'm a this and I'm a, you know, I, I, no, no. A Christian is who we are 24-7. Jesus Christ ought to be our complete and entire life. Not just, you know, look, what does it mean to be a Christian? I come to church once a week. You know, occasionally I'll maybe put something off plate. I may open up my Bible every now and then, and we could just name this, 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 little things we do. Listen, that's not Christianity. Christianity is Jesus Christ permeates your life 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He's always, he's the center, he's the focus. You don't do anything without thinking, is this what Jesus would want me to do? Not wear that silly little thing, WWJD, where someone makes money off of you. No, it's, it's who we are in life. I'm a Christian. What would Jesus want me to do? You know what we do so well? And I, I, I can be guilty of it too. We departmentalize. We, we set our life into pieces of the pie. And Yeah, that's my Jesus life, but this is something different. That's totally detached to that. We can't do that. It's who we are all the time. And it gives us a purpose. What's my purpose? To honor and glorify Jesus Christ in all that I do. If becoming a Christian did not give you a new purpose in life to honor God in everything you do so that you're as close to him as you can be, then very kindly I would say we're not risen with him. Corinthians tells us that whatever we do, we should do all to the glory of God. 2 Timothy talking about being a soldier, but this is talking about being a Christian, that we may please him. Is that our goal in life? I mean... Is it really our desire? Because sometimes we do things because we want to please other people, even if it's not right. But our desire really ought to be, is this pleasing to Jesus Christ? And then lastly, 
if we're risen with Christ, that means we have a new home. If you have your Bibles, flip over to Ephesians. We did not read these verses. <clears throat> because without this, you're not risen with Christ. You see, my life really started on Easter. 1978, I was, I was a high schooler, early in my high school career, uh, for those of you doing the count. Um, and I didn't go to church. I'd been to church maybe once in my life. And, and he wasn't Pastor Esposito, but Joe, my friend, had become a Christian and was going to church. And he, we used to live by each other for a long time, and we had, our family had moved, but we kept in contact. And he's like, you need to come to church with me on Easter Sunday. Now, I, I, it wasn't the church I went to when I was 10, but I'm like, okay, I'll go with you on Easter Sunday. And I went. And they had an auditorium that was a little more set up like this one, but the pulpit would have been down there. So I sat on the aisle about back where Robert is, seats behind me, and, and, and I heard the preaching that day. And they talked about this. They talked about what it means to know Jesus Christ and have your sins forgiven and be sure you have a home in heaven. And as the man preached and he got to the end of the service and he said, if you don't know that, you need to get that this morning. And I sat there. <coughs> God spoke to me. <coughs> I was on this side of the aisle, so let's see. I was over there. It was Pastor Esposito. He wasn't Pastor Esposito. It was Joe. Joe was right there. And, uh, and I'm like, I need to go down there and take care of that. Now, what he should have done is said, here, yes, let me take you. You know, there's a bunch of people at church. I don't know anybody. He's like, yeah, you should. I'm like, seriously? You could at least point, you know. And I got up and I went down there. I remember someone took us around the side of the building, talked to me. I already knew the truth. I had rejected it. I'd just been putting it off. And that day, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. That day, this happened to me. Now, what happened? Right here, let me explain it. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened. What does quicken mean? Quicken means to be brought back to life. And ye who are quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. I was dead that day. Spiritually speaking, I was bearing the bur burden and the guilt and the payment of my sin. And my soul was dead in sin. But when I walked down that aisle and I trusted what Jesus Christ did on the cross... For my sins, I was quickened. I was born again. My soul, which was dead in sin, was now born again and made alive. And my sin was dealt with. Look at verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ. For by grace are you saved. And hath raised us up together. See, that was the day that I could have the risen life with Christ, but it started with the fact that I had to trust Him and my spirit had to be made alive that was dead in sin. And I did it on that day. By the way, I, I, never, I, I don't regret that. If you came here this morning and maybe you don't know Jesus Christ, let me say this, and I don't say this mainly because this is how we all were or are. We're dead in our sins. You're dead in your sins. And Jesus Christ... We, the reason he had to rise from the dead is because he died on the cross for your sins. He paid the ultimate price so that you could have forgiveness of sins. And then he arose from the grave to prove that he had the power over life and death and could do that. Amen. So when I'm risen with Christ, you know what that means? I've got a new home. Yep. I don't know about you, but I don't like listening to the news. I listen to as little as possible to know just as much as I need to know about what's going on. You know why? It's depressing. Yeah. Things are not getting better, right? They're getting worse. Well, Technology is getting better, but morality is getting worse. Amen. But you know what? This world isn't my home. Now, I'm not saying we're irresponsible as, as, as human beings and as citizens. We do our best. But ultimately, my home is somewhere else. Yeah. If we live... Uh, I read uh, somewhere that some the oldest person that just lived, I think they're uh, 111 years old. Man, that is old. You think about that. When they were born, they were still riding horses. There was no airplane. Internet? Man, they didn't even have radio. Can you imagine seeing all that in your lifetime? 
100, say you get 150 years. What is that compared with eternity? Man, thank God I have an eternal home that will make the best that this world has to offer look like a ghetto. But it's because of Jesus Christ. And I'm risen in my heart. What about you this morning? Let's all stand together just for a minute.